Lesson 6 for July 10, 2016, Unit 2, A World Gone Wrong. Title, Everyone Blows It. For our devotional reading, 1 John 1, 5 through 10. Background scripture, Psalm 136 through 1 through 9 and 26. Romans 3, 9, 20. The print message, Romans 3, 9, 20. The key verse today is, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law, it is the knowledge of sin. Romans 3, 20, King James. No one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Our lesson aims for today is, number one, as a result of experience this lesson, you should be able to do these things. Number one, repeat Paul's claim that nearly from the beginning of God's creation, humankind began corrupting it, as well as the fact that God's retribution will surely come. Accept your personal role in corrupting God's beautiful creation. Be attentive to the biblical prophets and accept accountability to God. Our introduction paragraph, we must never underestimate the power of sin, acting though our daily temptations. Craig Brown Larson shared a thought-provoking story about the power of sin. I was at a party over lunch with a dozen of my fellow workers. It was a warm Chicago day in early September, and we had the windows wide open. Soon a bee found its way in, and after buzzing near, near me, landed on some food on the table. One of my colleagues, a few chairs away, took hold of an empty bottle of sparkling grape juice and put the mouth of the bottle near the bee. And when she did that, I expected the bee to be startled and fly away for its own safety. But as a butterfly might do instead, without a moment's hesitation, the bee flew to the mouth of the bottle as if it had done this a hundred times before and climbed inside the narrow opening. Immediately, my colleague put the cap on the bottle and screwed it shut. The bee spent the rest of our party drinking at the bottom of the bottle, as far as I know, the bee was never released. The moral to this story is simple. The bee's action represent how humankind is seduced by Satan. Yes, even Christians can be seduced. We know better, but certain temptations are just too much hard to resist. Satan knows our weak areas. He will concentrate on them until we sin. Then. He has us under his control. Although we are all under the power of sin, the good news is that we are only a confession away from forgiveness because of the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross. What is a conclusion? Romans 3, 9. What then? Are we better than they? No. In no wise, for we have before proved both Jew and Gentiles that they're all under sin. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that the Jews and the Gentiles are alike. All are under sin. Paul began his condemnation of the unrighteousness of all humankind, Jews and Gentiles alike. His overall point was that everybody needed God's righteousness. What shall we conclude then? Verse 9. 
Paul's opening question in this section referred to his previous discussion of the unrighteousness of his fellow Jews. Are we any better? No. Did being God's chosen people give the Jews a special advantage over the Gentile? In other words, did being a Jew by bloodline automatically make a Jew pers Jewish person more righteous than any Gentile? In practice, this is how Jews felt at the time of Paul's ministry. In fact, he had been guilty of acting in that same manner. To clear up any doubt, Paul answers his questions, their questions, decisively. Not at all. The Jews had no advantage at all. We could really argue that the Jews were worst off because they had the law and the words of the Old Testament prophets. They knew better, unlike the Christians, Gentiles, who had neither. What do you think? How many times have we heard people reflect on the day when they accepted Christ? Is that always a good thing? Discuss the answer. Verse 10, Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seek after God. They're all gone out of their way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that do it good. No, not one. Verse 13, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have deceit. The poison of ass is under their tongues. Another word for ass or snakes. Verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and they slay people. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. Verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Do we know someone like that? Yes, we do. Paul began this section by referencing Psalm 14. And it's near duplicate. Psalm 53, verses 10 to 12. David was writing about the folly of evil people compared to God. No one is righteous, verse 10. Except for Jesus, no one has lived, is living, or will live a perfect life. So, not all human beings can be justified before God based upon their own righteousness. Paul went a step further and made it plain that humankind cannot even comprehend uh, God's righteousness. Living in the aftermath of the fall in the Garden of Eden, we all have sinned, turned away from God. This perfectly describes human nature. When it comes to even coming close to being righteous, we are worthless, verse 12, NIV. Without our confession of our sins and God's right forgiveness of these sins through the blood of Jesus, followed by the simultaneous indwelling presence of his Holy Spirit, we are of no use to God. Paul also referenced Ecclesiastes 7.20 along with Psalm 14.3 and Psalm 53.3 in the closing of verse 12 to emphasize that even his own people were not able to claim righteousness. For the Bible tells us there is no one that does good, no, not even one. Not being righteous has consequences. Paul referenced Psalm 5, 9 and 143 in verse 13 in order to highlight the evil nature of the unsaved. The human heart is evil by nature because the Bible tells us we were born in sin, bred in sin, and will die in sin. 
resulting in evil words and deeds. Unlike God who speaks blessings, unsaved human beings speak curses. Such evil living results in violent actions. See Isaiah 59, 7. Finally, Paul referenced Psalm 36, 1, verse 18, making it clear that unsaved people did not reference God. Do we have some unsaved people in our families? Yes, we do. Fear of God was seen not only as respecting God, but also as the beginning of knowledge. See Proverbs 9:10. What do you think? How should the reality of our sinful nature shape our relationships with others? The function of the law, Romans 3, 19, 20. Now we know that what things whatsoever the law said, it said to them who are under the law, that every mouth might be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, thou shalt be no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Verse 20, NIV. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. What conclusions Paul draw from referencing Old Testament scriptures that represent the law? In verses 10, 18, question. First, with emphasis on his own people, and possibly to those in the Judaizer Christian movement. See Galatians 2.14 about the Judaizers. They're the ones say you must be circumcised as well as claiming Jesus Christ as your Savior. Whatsoever the law said, it says to those who are under the law. Persons following the law were not following it in part. Rather, they were following, following it totally. So the scripture's re reference he had just quoted made it clear that no one was righteous, not even the Jews who were followers of the law. Second, contrary to the belief of many Jews in the New Testament time, and even today, God was not talking about other people. We know how some people always refer to what other people were doing to make themselves look better than the others. Paul made it clear that everyone was unrighteous and had accountable, held accountable to God. There's no way out. Everyone, Jews and Gentiles, was and is guilty. Finally, brothers and sisters, Gentiles are also counted as unrighteous, as all the world, the whole world, verse 19. Counteracting the belief of his fellow Jews, Paul concluded in verse 20 that no one could be made righteous under the law, never. The law could not only make its followers conscious of their sins, the law could not change a person's heart like the Holy Spirit. It was powerless to make a person righteous. What do you think? What does it mean to be accountable to God? Our closing thought for this lesson is, many people are grateful for all that they have in life. We call it materialism. But others take every opportunity to abuse each privilege that comes along. Why is this wide variation? The psalmist said that God's people must give thanks for all the wonders of God has done for them 
and for God's steadfast love that endures forever. Your life, unfortunately, all human beings are capable of nasty, warring, deadly, fearless behaviors, although humans are capable of the noblest of actions. Look at the Good Samaritan. Depending on the circumstances, even as Christians, in parentheses, our human nature may cause us to respond hopelessly and angrily to negative assessments. We may even measure or grade some wrongs as worse than others. Good sin, little sin, big sin, on and on it goes. We recognize that people are different and respond differently to different stimuli. We are all under sin's power. Your world, our world. All humans are equally sinful and most likely candidates for the free grace of God in Christ. Yet, we are mindful that God will judge all, irresponsible of identity. But we also know that God forgives us over and above when we repent and all who repent before him. We are convinced that we are not justified by good deeds or good works, but rather by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. That is why we want to tell everyone that have ears to listen that Jesus forgives sins, past, present, future, day, day after day. And he cares dearly for us because he laid down his life as God had commanded him to pay our sin debt, for we owe him. Three days afterward, he would rise again for us, for our justification, that we're righteous now. We've just been bought back from the slave market of sin and the blood and the water that he gave up washes away all of our sin. All we have to do is repent as soon as you can that God will forgive us over and over because the blood from that fountain of his love will never dry up as water would. Our closing prayer is this. Righteous God, we thank you today for your son, Jesus, whose redemptive work on Calvary's hill, place of the skull, gave us the way to come from under the power of sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.